This is the seventh day of the January 91 seven-day retreat in spring water. And we will, as we usually do, read from writings by Huang Po and Krishnamurti. Wang Po was a Zen teacher of the 10th century in China. Someone asked me yesterday in a meeting whether I was aware that I was influencing people by talking to them. And I'm wondering whether we can listen today, openly, simply, without resistance or eagerness to accept what is said or read, or rather see the resistance if it's there, or the eagerness to accept, to see it, so that it does not influence the listening. This is all copyrighted material, so even though we're taping, cassettes will not be for sale. They can just be listened to here. This book is called The Zen Teaching of Wang Po, translated by John Blofeld. The word Buddha used in here does not necessarily refer to historic personage of the Buddha, but to truth, enlightened truth, or absolute truth. Truth is enough. The ma and there, these talks were written down by uh, Wang Po's disciple, Pei Su, who was a scholar, a Buddhist scholar. It was also, he also was the disciple of Wang Po and the governor of the province where Wang Po taught. The master said to me, all the Buddhas and all sentient beings are nothing but the one mind beside which nothing exists. This mind which is without beginning is unborn and indestructible. It is not green nor yellow and has neither form nor appearance. It does not belong to the categories of things which exist or do not exist, nor can it be thought of in terms of young or old. It is neither long nor short, big nor small, for it transcends all limits, measures, names, traces, and comparisons. It is that which you see before you. Begin to reason about it and you at once fall into error. It is like the boundless void which cannot be fathomed or measured. The one mind alone is the Buddha and there is no distinction between the Buddha and sentient beings, but that sentient beings are attached to forms and so seek externally for Buddhahood. By their very seeking they lose it, for that is using mind to grasp mind. Even though they do their utmost for a full eon, they will not be able to attain to it. They do not know that if they put a stop to conceptual thought and forget their anxiety, the Buddha will appear before them. For this mind is the Buddha and the Buddha is all living beings. It is not the less for being manifested in ordinary beings, 
nor is it greater for being manifested in the Buddhas. It has never been taught that men should seek for learning or form concepts. Studying the way is just a figure of speech. Studying the way in quotation marks is just a figure of speech. It is a method of arousing people's interest. In fact, the way is not something which can be studied. Study leads to the retention of concepts and so the way is entirely misunderstood. Moreover, the way is not something especially existing. Truly, it is not located anywhere. The first step is to refrain from knowledge-based concepts. This implies that if you were to follow an empirical method to the utmost limit, on reaching that limit, you would still be unable to locate mind. He has spelled with a capital M. The way is spiritual truth and was originally without name or title. It was only because people ignorantly sought for it empirically that Buddhas appeared and taught them to eradicate this method of approach. Fearing that nobody would understand, they selected the name Way. You must not allow this name to lead you into forming a mental concept of a road. So it is said, when the fish is caught, pay no more attention to the trap. When body and mind are spontaneous, the way is reached and mind is understood. I forgot to mention that words, sentences, paragraphs are eliminated. This is edited in this way. It's not to present Wang Po in full, but to, to clarify things for, our, for us. What is called supreme perfect wisdom implies that there is really nothing whatever to be attained. If you're able to understand this, you will realize that the way of the Buddhas and the way of the devils are equally wide of the mark. The original pure glistening universe is neither square nor round, big nor small. It is without any such distinctions as long and short. It is beyond attachment and activity, ignorance and enlightenment. You must see clearly that there is really nothing at all. The great chilicosms, numberless as grains of sand, are mere bubbles. All wisdom and all holiness are but streaks of lightning. None of them have the reality of mind. Mind is one. How can it lack a single hair of anything? Once I put this question to the master, how many of the four or five hundred persons gathered here on this mountain have fully understood your reverence's teaching? The master answered, their number cannot be known. Why? Because my way is through mind awakening. How can it be conveyed in words? Speech only produces some effect when it falls on the uninstructed ears of children. When we talk of the knowledge I, in quotation marks, may gain 
the knowledge I may gain, the learning I may achieve, my intuitive understanding, my deliverance from rebirth, and my moral way of living. Our successes make these concepts seem pleasant to us, but our failures make them appear deplorable. What is the use of all that? I advise you to remain uniformly quiescent and above all activity. Do not deceive yourselves with conceptual thinking and do not look anywhere for the truth, for all that is needed is to refrain from allowing concepts to arise. We can add here, when they do arise as they do, to see them as concepts, not as the truth. It is obvious that mental concepts and external perceptions are equally misleading and that the way of the Buddhas is as dangerous to you as the way of demons. When all the Buddhas manifest themselves in the world, they proclaim nothing but the one mind. Discuss it as you may, how can you even hope to approach the truth through words? So, full understanding can come to you only through an inexpressible mystery. The approach to it is called the gateway of the stillness beyond all activity. If you wish to understand, know that a sudden comprehension comes when the mind is purged of all the clutter of conceptual and discriminatory thought activity. <coughs> Those who seek the truth by means of intellect and learning only get further and further away from it. Not till your thoughts cease all their branching here and there. Not till you abandon all thoughts of seeking for something. Not till your mind is motionless as wood or stone will you be on the right road. Though others may talk of the way of the Buddhas as something to be reached by various pious practices and by scripture study, you must have nothing to do with such ideas. A perception, sudden as blinking, that subject and object are one, will lead to a deeply mysterious, wordless understanding. And by this understanding, you will awake to the truth. When you happen upon someone who has no understanding, you must claim to know nothing. He may be delighted by his discovery of some way to enlightenment, Yet, if you allow yourselves to be persuaded by him, you will experience no delight at all, but suffer both sorrow and disappointment. Even if you do obtain from him some trifling method, it will only be a thought-constructed thing having nothing to do with truth. Truth is something never lost, even in moments of delusion, nor is it gained at the moment of enlightenment. It depends on nothing and is attached to nothing. It is all-pervading, spotless beauty. It is the self-existent and uncreated absolute. Ah, it is a jewel beyond all price. When a sudden flash of thought occurs in your mind and you see it for a dream or an illusion, then you can enter into the state reached by the Buddhas of the past. Not that the Buddhas of the past really exist or that the Buddhas of the future have not yet come into existence. Above all, have no longing to become a future Buddha or an enlightened being. Your sole concern should be, as thought succeeds thought, to avoid clinging to any of them. 
nor may you entertain the least ambition to be a Buddha here and now, meaning an enlightened being. Even if a Buddha arises, do not think of him as enlightened or deluded, good or evil. Hasten to rid yourself of any desire to cling to him. Cut him off in the twinkling of an eye. On no account seek to hold him fast, for a thousand locks could not stay him, nor a hundred thousand feet of rope bind him. This being so valiantly strive to banish and annihilate him. I will now make luminously clear how to set about being rid of that Buddha. Consider the sunlight. You may say it is near, yet if you follow it from world to world, you will never catch it in your hands. Then you may describe it as far away and lo, it will, you will see it just before your eyes. Follow it and behold, it escapes you, run from it and it follows you close. You can neither possess it nor have done with it. From this example you can understand how it is with the true nature of all things and henceforth there will be no need to grieve or to worry about such things. When the moment of understanding comes, do not think in terms of understanding, not understanding or not not understanding, for none of these is something to be grasped. This truth of thusness, when grasped, is grasped, but he who grasps it is no more conscious of having done so than someone ignorant of it is conscious of his failure. Pesu asks here the last selection, but how can we prevent ourselves from falling into the error of making distinctions between this and that? Distinctions, reactions, wanting, fearing. Wang Po, by realizing that though you eat the whole day through, no single grain has passed your lips and that a day's journey has not taken you a single step forward. Also, by uniformly abstaining from such notions as self and other, do not permit the events of your daily lives to bind you, but never withdraw yourselves from them. Avoid the error of thinking in terms of past, present, and future. The past has gone, the present is a fleeting moment, and the future has not yet come. When you practice meditation, sit in the proper position, stay perfectly tranquil, and do not permit the least movement of your minds to disturb you. This alone is what is called liberation. Ah, be diligent, be diligent. A little pamphlet here which is called Authentic Report of Ten Talks given by Krishnamurti in Ohio 1944. And a questioner asks, You said a man who meets <coughs> you said a man who meets anger with anger becomes anger. Do you mean that when we fight cruelty with the weapons of cruelty, we too become the enemy? Yet if we do not protect ourselves, the bandit fells us. Krishnamurti, surely that thing which you fight, you become. If I am angry, 
and you meet me with anger, what is the result? More anger. You have become that which I am. If I am evil and you fight me with evil means, then you also become evil, however righteous you may feel. If I am brutal and you use brutal methods to overcome me, then you become brutal like me. And this we have done thousands of years. Surely there is a different approach than to meet hate by hate. If I use violent methods to quell anger in myself, then I am using wrong means for a right end and therefore, and thereby the right end ceases to be. In this there is no understanding. There is no transcending anger. Anger is to be studied tolerantly and understood. It is not to be overcome through violent means. Anger may be the result of many causes and without comprehending them, there is no escape from anger. We have created the enemy, the bandit, and through becoming ourselves the enemy, in no way brings about an end to enmity. We have to understand the cause of enmity and cease to feed it by our thought, feeling, and action. This is an arduous task demanding constant self-awareness and intelligent pliability. For what we are, the society, the state is. The enemy and the friend are the outcome of our thought and action. We are responsible for creating enmity, and so it is more important to be aware of our own thought and action than to be concerned with a foe and a friend, for right thinking puts an end to division. Love transcends the friend and the enemy. This was May 44. This book is called Questions and Answers, Krishnamurti. Comes out of the Krishnamurti Foundation, India, published in 82. Question. You say, we are the world, in quotation marks. You say, we are the world. But the majority of the world seem to be heading for mass destruction. Can a minority of integrated people outweigh the majority? Okay. Are you, are we that minority? Is there one among us who is totally free of all this? Or are we partially contributing to the hatred of each other psychologically? You may not be able to stop one country attacking another, but psychologically, are you free of your common inheritance, which is your tribal glorified nationalism? Are we free from violence? Violence exists where there is a wall around ourselves. Do please understand all this. And we have built ourselves walls 15 feet high and 10 feet thick. All of us have these walls around us. From that arises violence and the sense of immense loneliness. So the minority and the majority are you. If a group of us have psychologically transformed ourselves fundamentally, we will never ask this question because then we are something entirely different. Question. 
questioner. When one realizes deeply the importance of awareness of one's inner and outer actions, yet one slips into inattention so easily. Must there be a Krishnamurti, the books, the cassettes to keep one alert? Why? Why this gap between understanding and immediate action? Okay. Why is inattention so easy, so common? It is taking place all the time. To be aware of what is happening inside the skin and what is happening outside the skin, must there be somebody to remind you of it? Clothes do, make, do not make a man. By putting on robes, a monk does not become a saint. Either the clothes remind you that one must be constantly aware, then you depend on the clothes. Or without these outward garments, can you be aware and so not slip into inattention? Is awareness, whatever it is, to be cultivated, developed through practice, through saying, I must be aware, and meditating on that awareness? or having some kind of thing to remind one of it constantly, whether a picture or a hair shirt, which is so uncomfortable that one is constantly reminded to be aware. Let us find out what it means to be aware. One cannot know everything that is happening in the world, what the politicians are doing, what the secret service is doing, what the army or the scientists are doing. One does not know what one's neighbor is doing, nor what one's wife or husband is doing inwardly. One cannot know everything. But one can know or become aware of one's own life inwardly. Now, is that inner movement different from the outer movement? Is that which is outside the pollution, the corruption, the chicanery, the deception, the hypocrisy, the violence, is that very different from oneself inwardly? Or is it a constant movement like the tide going in and out? Can one be aware of this movement, see and observe it? Can one, in the process of observing this flow, this unitary movement, make any choice? In this movement is awareness based on choice? Can one observe this movement which is oneself and the world, for the world is oneself, without any choice? That observation is awareness which one does not have to cultivate, about which one does not have to have somebody to remind one, neither books nor tapes. Once one sees for oneself the truth that this movement out there and the movement in here are essentially similar, one does not need any reminders. It is the same movement that has created the world, the society, the army, the navy, the scientists, the politician, and that movement is oneself. Can one seriously, not deceiving oneself, go very, very deeply into this awareness without choice, observing it without any direction, one has to be extremely watchful. Naturally, that awareness cannot be constant. But to be aware that it is not constant is to be aware of inattention. To be aware of inattention is attention. One cannot reasonably, sanely say, I'm going to be alert from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to sleep. One cannot, unless one is neurotic and practices saying, I'm going to be aware, I'm going to be aware. 
then it becomes words and has no meaning. But if one sees that attention, awareness cannot be maintained all the time, which is a fact, then inattention, not being attentive, has its value, has its meaning. Because in inattention, you discover that you're not attentive. The questioner asks, why is there a gap between understanding and immediate action? What does one mean by understanding? Somebody explains the nature and the structure of the atom. One listens carefully and says, yes, I understand what you're saying. Or one listens to a philosopher and says, yes, I understand the basis of your theories. All that is intellectual discernment, understanding. That is the function of the intellect, to discern, to evaluate, to analyze. At that level, one says, I understand. The questioner asks, why is there a gap between understanding of that kind and immediate action? One has to deeply understand that the word never is the thing. The explanation is never the actuality. Now, understanding takes place when the mind is quiet, not merely at the intellectual level. You're telling me something, something serious, philosophic. If my mind is chattering, wandering away, I cannot fully comprehend what you're saying. So I must listen to you, not translate what you're saying, or interpret what you're saying, or listen partially because I'm frightened of what you might say. For then the mind is disturbed, moving, changing, volatile. Whereas, if I really want to listen to what you're saying, the mind must be quiet. Then there's a depth of understanding which is not merely intellectual or verbal. When there is profound perception of what is being said, false or true, and one can discover the truth in the false, then in that state of silent understanding, action is naturally immediate. There's no gap between the two. When one is standing on the edge of a precipice, one does not argue. The intellect does not say, let us discuss, think about it. One jumps away from the danger. There's immediate action of self-protection which is healthy, natural, normal. One does not stand in front of a bus which is running one down, or stand looking at a dangerous snake or animal. It is a natural, instinctive response to save oneself. If perception is complete, which can only take place when the mind is quietly listening, not accepting, not denying, but listening, then that perception and action are the same. Questioner. When I listen to you, there is an urgency to change. When I return home, it fades. What am I to do? K. What are you to do? Is the urgency to change due to or influenced by the speaker? While you're here, you are driven into a corner, but when you leave, that is no longer so. 
It means that you're being challenged, influenced, driven, persuaded, and when that is gone, you are where you were. Now what is one to do? Please let us think out the right answer to this. What is one to do? I come to this gathering from a distant place. It is a lovely day. I have put up a tent and I'm really interested. I have read not only what the speaker has said, but a great deal besides. I know the Christian and the Buddhist concepts, the Hindu mythology, and I've also done different forms of meditation, the TM, the Tibetan, Hindu, and Buddhist. But I'm dissatisfied with all those, so I come here and I listen. Now I'm prepared. Now am I prepared to listen completely? I cannot listen completely if I bring all my knowledge here with me. I cannot listen or learn or comprehend completely if I belong to some sect, if I'm attached to one particular concept, and if I also want to add to that what is said here. I must come, if I am serious, with a free mind, with a mind that says, let's find out for God's sake, not I want to add what you're saying to what I already know. So what is one's attitude going to be? The speaker has been saying constantly, freedom is absolutely necessary. Psychological freedom first, not the physical freedom which you have in the democratic, if not in the totalitarian countries. Inward freedom can only come about when one understands one's conditioning, the conditioning which is both social and cultural, religious, economic, and physical. Can one be free of that, of the psychological conditioning, of the conditioning me first, everybody else second? What is difficult in all this is that we cling to something so deeply that we're unwilling to let go. One has studied various things and one is attracted to a particular psychological school. One has gone into it, studied it, and found out that there's a great deal in it and one sticks to it. And then one comes here and listens and adds what one has heard to that. So it all becomes a melange, a mixture of everything. Are we not doing that? our minds become very confused. And for the time being, when you are here, that confusion is somewhat pushed away or diminished. But when you leave, it's back again. Can one be aware of this confusion? Not only while you're here, but when you are at home? That is much more important. So what does all this indicate? We have the intelligence to solve technological problems, the problem-solving mind. We all have that. But it is not intelligence. The capacity to think clearly, objectively, and to be aware of the limitations of thinking, that is the beginning of intelligence. I'll say that again the capacity to think clearly, objectively, and to be aware of the limitations of thinking. That is the beginning of intelligence. We worship thinking. The more cleverly we can think, the greater we see ourselves as being. Whereas, if we could observe our own confusion, our own individual narrow way of looking at life, if we could be aware of all that, we would see how thought is perpetually creating problems. Thought creates the image, and that image divides. To see that requires intelligence. To see psychological dangers is intelligence. But apparently, we do not see those things. 
That means somebody has to goad you all the time, push you, drive you, ask you, persuade you, beg you to make you aware of yourself. And then to move from there, not just stay there. And I'm afraid nobody is going to do that for you. Not even the most enlightened human being, because then you become his slave. Vitality, physical and psychological energy is, as you are now, being dissipated in conflict, in worry, in chattering, in endless gossip, not only with others but with oneself. This endless chattering, it all dissipates the psychological energy that is needed to observe ourselves in the mirror of relationship. We're all related to somebody or other. And so to discover our illusions, images, absurdities and idiocies. Then out of that observation comes freedom and the intelligence which will show the way of life. Here's one final selection taken from Krishnamurti's notebook. Almost one full year of entries in different countries in the 60s. 61. This particular one originated in India. Across the river, smoke was going up in a straight column. It was, it was a simple movement bursting into the sky. There wasn't a breath of air. There wasn't a ripple on the river. And every leaf was still. The parrots were the only noisy movement as they flashed by. Even the little fisherman's boat did not disturb the water. Everything seemed to have frozen in stillness, except the smoke. Even though it was going so straight up in the sky, there was a certain gaiety in it and freedom of total action. And beyond the village and the smoke was the glowing sky of the evening. It had been a cool day and the sky had been open and there was the light of a thousand winters. It was short, penetrating and expansive. It went with you everywhere. It wouldn't leave you. Like perfume, it was in the most unexpected places. It seemed to have entered into the most secret corners of one's being. It was a light that left no shadow, and every shadow lost its depth. Because of it, all substance lost its density. It was as though you looked through everything, through the trees on the other side of the wall, through your own self. Your self was as transparent as the sky and as open. It was intense, and to be with it was to be passionate, not the passion of feeling or desire, but a passion that would never wither or die. It was a strange light. It exposed everything and made vulnerable. And what had no protection was love. 
You couldn't be what you were. You were burnt out without leaving any ashes. And unexpectedly, there was not a thing but that light. We will end here for today.